Okay, so uh, thanks uh, a lot for the organizer and uh, for inviting me here. Um, and also, actually, thanks for Kenneth to just introduce a little bit about uh, the quantum neural network, or you know, what I call variational quantum circuits. So, so that's exactly my, my topic. And um, probably just a spoiler alert that my talk might be very different from all the remaining talks because uh, you probably don't see any proof. Uh, and even the claim is probably just like a very, you know, graphical. Okay, so uh, I, I guess uh, just to recap what we want to do for, you know, starting this kind of question. So I, I, I guess the main question we want, or main target we want to achieve is that we want to find uh, near-term quantum applications. And uh, we do see a lot of quantum algorithm, but uh, even just, you know, try to optimize the resources seems still, you know, be out of reach, at least for maybe for the, uh, next decades or so. So, but uh, actually this is uh, something I uh, copied directly from John Persky's talk, that uh, we should just use what we have and you know, try to use them in a variational way. And uh, so you probably heard the word uh, a lot like, you know, this is a, a typical picture, people call this hybrid quantum classical optimizers, but it also have different names, which is imagine you have uh, a quantum processors, which uh, you know, sometimes people call this variational quantum circuits or parameter quantum circuits, or maybe like physics called it just ANSYS. So what they really have is just quantum circuits, which each gate is parameterized by some like a real parameter. And like typical gates are just like uh, poly rotation gates with the parameter being the angle. And you try to solve some problem, you know, through this kind of interaction with a classical optimizer, uh, which you think uh, it's very like, you know, just variational method in the classical sense, or maybe just like machine learning problems because they're also variational. You try to think I have some way, you know, depending on the feedback from the quantum processor, I can try to optimize that. And, and actually there has been a lot of study along this line. This is going to be extreme, uh, extremely interesting, especially for the NISC area. And there are a lot of uh, empirical study already. But of course, you know, so far, because we don't have the large machine, so most of the study, app, you know, they have limitation up to the simulation uh, limit. And indeed, you know, there has been a lot of proposal along this line, like uh, QLA or VQE, or like you know, sometimes you call, even call this quantum neural networks. Um, so, first, I want to just have you glance at uh, you know, just in slightly more details about the variational quantum circuits versus the classical neural networks. And uh, so, uh, on the left side, just a very, very simple model for the feedforward uh, classical neural networks. So you have like layers of the neural neurons, you have ways associated with different uh, you know, nodes, and you just do some like calculation, which I actually show a little bit more in detail later on. So this is what the classical one does. And this is you know, on the right hand side, this is the variational quantum circuits. So what you should imagine is that you have like maybe single layer, like a single cubic gates, parameterized by the angles, like rota poly rotation gates, you have another layer of entangling gates, and you know, so on and so forth. And of course, you have input and output to both sides, both circuits are variational. You want to try to some some optimization problem or for maybe some machine learning type problems. So they're very similar to each other. So in that sense, it seems to be very promising because we see like you know the classical neural networks work pretty well in practice. And uh, so that's actually you make people believe this might be you know something can give you something useful, especially they can be Im uh, implemented on the near term. Um, so so what I want to talk about is based on in this in a simple question. Um, uh, so usually the way people treat uh, you know, this similarity as a guarantee, then if we just think there's maybe some magic we can directly use, you know, treating all the techniques from the machine learning as a black box, we can just directly apply. And uh, the specific question I, I'm trying to think about, can we have like a you know, better understanding, you know, try to open the magic box from like a machine learning, try to see uh, what, you know, in what sense those techniques can apply. <laughs> And uh, you know maybe uh, or will there be any difference? You know any changes we want to make for quantum neural networks other than classical ones? You know in order to try to answer that question, uh, so here is like you know my very personal perspective of uh, the status of the research we have for classical machine learning and quantum machine learning. I think on the, the top line, just the classical machine learning, we have a very successful empirical study at a very very large scale, and uh, you know the theoretical ones actually is trying to catch up. But still, there's uh, seem to be some gap. I don't know how large it's going to be, so I put dash line there. But like you know, it's really important for people to understand that. But uh, the quantum uh, for quantum machine learning, since this has just started very very recently, 
um, the theoretical study and the empirical study, same, uh, in both of them, they are, are their in infancy. So they're not much you know, started yet. And furthermore, you know, if we follow the classical story and we try to do you know, empirical study first, you know, then we observe a lot of things, like maybe uh, then the theory can catch up. Uh, we face another difficulty for doing that for quantum because uh, even though we have a very uh, exciting progress for like, you know, the quantum supermassive, we have larger machine, but still they do not seem to be very easy to scale or very accessible to all the researchers. So, so if you want to do empirical study, I think maybe what you can do right now is just simulation right, by yourself, classical simulation, then you have some limitation for doing that. So um, a specific uh, strategy I'm trying to adapt here is that can we somehow uh, you know, leverage the techniques from the theoretical study of classical machine learning to help us understand better about the quantum machine learning in a theoretical way. Of course, it cannot solve you, uh, answer all the questions, but maybe it can give you some hints or some you know, guidelines. So when we, have, you know, when we do have like large uh, quantum machines, so those guidelines can help you to you know, guide the empirical study for quantum. Of course, as I said, it cannot solve all the problems, but maybe it can tell you what are impossible. Or maybe uh, there, there's some you know, uh, you know, parameters and direction you should have just followed. So this is the general methodology I want to follow. And uh, if you think in that direction, you might want to ask what are the important questions. You know, if I want to follow that kind of methodology, that can be answered. Uh, and uh, I, I want to just show, that we have seen a lot of you know, research, a very exciting research on one slide. They try to ask the question, what are the new types of quantum application if you want to just use a version of quantum circuits? And uh, I think they're very important. But somehow there's some limitation for this kind of line of research. Uh, you know, the, some like you know routine for this kind uh, you know research. They they map the application to the version of quantum circuits, and they try to demonstrate some like a proof of uh, a concept or principle simulation on small size system. And uh, indeed, it, you know, for those research you see in the published paper, they work pretty well. And then we just hope it scales. Okay, so uh, it seems you know I think this is really good uh, you know evidence. But maybe it's a slight pessimistic because we don't try to think whether we can release scales. So, I, so, so what the, the question I want to ask is that uh, can we uh, study the training of those system? Can we uh, maybe get some handle on that to ask you know to study either it can be trained efficiently or maybe uh, how you should train this kind of system? Can, can I ask a quick yeah. question? Yes. So you know, you, you you pointed out that the on the classical side theory um, really lags yes. practice in terms of uh, understanding why near near method, you know, why these variational algorithms work well. Uh, so would you expect on the quantum side uh, to to catch up with the with the classical theory or to surpass it? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I, I think so far it's, 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 we're not there yet, right? So we we just try to think we can we match the classical understanding for quantum. Uh -huh. So would you would you in, in your talk would you say <laughs> what's, what are the most interesting things you know classically? Uh, I I don't have that explicit in my slides. I just give some examples along the line. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that's a good question. Maybe we can discuss. Okay. So um, I think you know the training problem is important because. It actually has significant practical impact because the number of iterations actually determine maybe feasibility of your experiments, and also uh, this is actually according to some like m my personal e experience that I think maybe for training quantum you might need something different from classical, and but of, of course uh, we still can just uh, uh, you know you know try to use the method same methodology people use to study the classical uh, training problem. For example, you can uh, try to think, of, you know, think about or s study the landscape of your loss function. You know, study its behavior like first or second order method when you apply to this uh, particular landscape, and maybe different strategy in parameterization or regularization. So, so what I gonna, uh, you know, uh, you know, talk in the remaining of the, uh, you know, I guess 20, yeah, maybe 20 minutes that I will show you just like two examples. Uh, along this line, which I, I think there's some interesting things I can say. So, so the first example is actually a little uh, pessimistic, but you all want to try to see what you cannot do in the very beginning. So I'm basically trying to show like a training with you know variational quantum circuits in general is hard, 
And this is not surprising at all because you have tried you know, train this circuit by yourself, you immediately realize it's hard. And, but uh, to get some theoretical handles on that, uh, there are not m too many results. So there has been like a numerical result showing the landscape for certain you know, optic function. It is uh, very uh, non-convex. And there also another problem we know that if you use gradient-based uh, approach to train this kind of system, if you use like a random initialization of the system, then uh, very easily you don't see any gradient. So the gradient vanishes to zero. And uh, so this actually applies to star larger of uh, uh, size of this kind of circuits. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, um, this does not rule out maybe for interesting classes, we do have some way to train this kind of system. And uh, especially for QOA, that's like a well-started topic. There has been a lot of research done in that di uh, direction. I, I think, uh, you know, Farhe has a talk maybe tomorrow talk talking about, you know, what you can do in, in that direction. And I think that there's some also other interesting results recently talking about if your circuits are extremely over-parameterized maybe there's some way you can actually prove you can convert to the group one. And, but uh, what I'm gonna tell you is that in some work in progress we show, uh, in the context of supervised learning, there exists very reasonable setting and this, uh, where the loss function uh, um, apply a deparameterized, uh, you know, just like deparameter variation of quantum circuits. Uh, you know, we use a sample like just the linear and D data points. You can have like a two to the D uh, local optimal for actually any uh, integer uh, natural number d. So uh, what's different between, you know, from our, our result, you know, from the previous one is that this can even activate to very, very small size, uh, you know, quantum circuits. So this says, you know, the training problem is not just for large ones, even for small ones, you should avoid this kind, you know, instance. And I think another nice thing is that it actually demonstrates some difference between classical uh, neural network and quantum ones. Yeah, actually, I'm going to talk about that. So, yeah, l let me just make sense of this kind of statement. So, uh, so we first just uh, you know just quickly revisit, revisit what the classical neural network is. Um, so, uh, you just imagine you have some input, and uh, there's you know you uh, have uh, layers of uh, neurons, and where the you know the wi and w n plus one just like in representing the parameters you have each layer. So, and you have input x, you know there's some um, output of your neural network that's red hat. So all the parameters W, you usually think about there's some like loss function representing with their codes. They should be small, with their large, they should be far away. So usually people can use like a square loss. And if you want to train this on like um, uh, M data points, you just sum over all those data points you want to train and try to optimize for the W. So this in a very, very simple type of neural type of work is called linear because its evolution just involves I mean, the multiplication of those matrices. You can make this, uh, Slightly nonlinear. Actually, this is important by adding some like nonlinear activation function. And the usual uh, examples are like Ralu and Sigmod. So what we know classically, um, it's uh, interesting that if you don't have any this kind of non uh, you know linear parts like Ralu and Sigmod, we actually know even for like deep linear networks for this type of training, uh, there's no bad local optimal. So that means either you have a local optimal which is global one or you have all of them to the critical points, they're all saddle points. So you have some way to escape from those saddle points. And once you have activation function, like a nonlinear activation function, even for just like one neuron, just like one layer of sense, like one single output, you can construct expansion many local optimal. So actually this is a paper from like 95, so like a very, very long time ago. So if you think about, you know, in a very, very simple case, just compare classical and quantum. Um, so this is, you know, like one qubit version of quantum where just they have like two poly rotation gates. And it does not have like the nonlinear activation function like classical ones. And you, f you think, you know, the quantum one just like multiply this unitary matrices. And as long as we are encoding and output, you know, we just use very, very simple ones. So there seems no nonlinear part of your entire neutral networks. So you might ask, want to ask a question, that, does it have a nice landscape? I think uh, the a conceptual message here is that no, you know, quantum have uh, another way to create a uh, local optimal rather than you know, using the uh, non-neurality from activation function. So here I come just to prove by pictures. So this is something you know, people use uh, in the classical construction. They try to use uh, non-neurality in a basic activation function and create a loss function, something like this. When you add in one simple point, you know, for one dimension, 
you're actually creating some like a bad local minimum like this. And you can actually keep doing that. And we actually show this is not something possible because we don't have this kind of linearity, but we do have interference. This is especially because the way we parameterize our circuits, we have the each of the eyes, you know, theta for some poly matrices. So, so what you see here, you could just imagine, I have like a two, you know, wave that are created by two samples, and we have some, you know, interference of them because I sum them up in my loss function, then I can create some interference, then I can create a bad local minimum. And uh, you can actually have some way to scale this up to multi-parameters and create an expansion of many by some like direct sum argument, which I don't have time to talk about. Okay, so, yeah, so that's just one example uh, to show in there indeed very hard to train. And uh, the second example is that uh, there are some cases where uh, you can actually, you know, make the training smoother by somehow changing your loss function, you know, make, uh, you know, in a sense become nice. So this is the example in the genetic model. Um, so here I just to give you a very uh, you know, brief introduction to uh, these classical ones. So um, you probably uh, heard from the news like the deep fake, you can generate some like uh, human looking pictures even though you, that, you know, it's, it's already real. And one uh, and, and very powerful method to do this is to use the genetic adversary networks when people call the GAN to train this kind of model. And uh, there has been proposal to use quantum for this kind of task to generate some like distributions. And uh, why won't you do that? Uh, for the classical distribution, you know, using quantum to generate that is very uh, easy to see because quantum circuits are good at sampling. So if you look at all this quantum supremacy uh, proposals, they're all sampling tasks. But because you know, that's the domain we should uh, expect quantum can do better. And uh, you can actually think about more about how about we just now generating quantum data. I can gen uh, sorry, I can gen generate quantum data. And you know, by definition, so only quantum circuits can generate quantum data. So you need a quantum to do that. And uh, another reason is that you might imagine this, you know, this way, uh, you know, quant generating quantum data might have some actual use. Just imagine you have some like unknown uh, subject in your experiments. You want to figure out what's the structure of it. You have some like a you know, variational, you know, maybe from kind of matter physics, you know, answer that you want to figure out all the parameters. So you have all those same, but you want to fit into the model. So that's effectively just in talking about how to generate quantum data from, you know, the experiments. And we actually show some, ac uh, another surprising application of this uh, later on. So I think importantly, just remember all this kind of, uh, you know, saying they're based on variational quantum circuits. So they're likely to be implementable on the near term um, machines. So again, so the, the actual contribution for us is still about the training. So we tried to think about the training uh, problem for this quantum generative model. And this is because uh, training this kind of uh, you know, generative model classically uh, is actually very uh, delicate and unstable and training the quantum ones uh, could be even worse. So this uh, you know, has been a lot of a study, a most like an empirical study, tried to use this kind of idea to uh, generate, uh, you know, quantum gas, but they, you know, have very limited uh, number of qubits and parameters. They can actually show convergence. So, uh, so we have a, a, a paper appear in last year, New Rips. So we tried to do this, uh, you know, uh, in hope to scale the training of this kind of model. Uh, so, so this is what the, in the picture we put in uh, our paper. So this shows that we can very smoothly train this for like eight qubits, and for the, each gate, you can have like 200 gates. The 200 gates and uh, rotating gates, and actually we can do a, a little bit more than that. And it's, um, we didn't put that into paper. So if you think about maybe your qubits are noisy, so uh, we actually model about uh, the experimental noise from the ion trap experiments, and just try to put a different layer of noise into the system and try to see whether your training still be uh, robust. So this is the picture we have for four qubits, and why we do this for four qubits because. Just direct comparison from a paper from Chris Morrow's group. Okay, so so that's one uh, contribution we have. There's another uh, application which is surprising that we can use this kind of uh, you know generative model to compress quantum circuits. So we actually have uh, an example we show. There's the 52 gate circuits can approximate uh, a quantum Hamiltonian simulation circuit over like uh, 10,000 gates um, uh, for uh, using product formula. So let, let's talk, talk a little bit about more of that. So why this genetic network can be useful for 
uh, compressing circuits. So just looking into uh, what he does, um, the idea is that you want to generate something that you cannot distinguish from the real stuff. And uh, if you just think about uh, the very simple in a fixed one input and uh, have the quantum circuit or have the genetic network try to uh, make them indistinguishable, you actually approximate output for one input uh, for this uh, particular circuits. You can scale that up, you know, try to catch in all the information for all inputs by using uh, the Troy geometric isomorphism. That's an isomorphism mapping uh, quantum uh, circuits to quantum state. So what you lose in, uh, by doing that is that you don't ha no longer have worst case guarantee. You only have average case guarantee. So, so what we achieve is that we can actually use our system to, uh, you know, again, train a cer certain gates. You can imagine we have this ideal gates, which is the, the actual circuit, and you want to also get something um, very, very close. And we have the output fidelity you know, for this particular one. Uh, average on input, a very close one. But it, uh, of course, it, it cannot guarantee out the worst case, uh, you know, error. So it's, uh, the worst case error is, is much larger than uh, what you have from the product formula. But if you look at this, this is still useful because the the noise in actually in the near term circuit, is, you know, is actually about the same level. So even you have very precise, uh, uh, you know, circuits, it does not give you, you know, guarantee give you something good. And actually, you can uh, try to use this. Uh, as a uh, you know, scaled-down experimental uh, demonstration for like a physics motivated uh, quantum circuits. And uh, for example, if you have some like uh, you know, idea from physics, you want to say there's a certain type, you know, simulation circuits I want to use, but I don't know how to compress that into uh, you know, the quota, you know, the number of gates I'm allowed in my experiments, you can try this. You know, maybe you can give you something good enough for your experiments. And what we actually did on the technical side is that we tried to uh, use the optimal transport uh, norm to smoothize the landscape of the, the training. So um, if you heard this term for the first time, um, so this has been well studied the field in mathematics. Um, it has been used classically. The idea is that if you use this kind of norm, it actually introduces different kind of topology on your like, you know, data space. Somehow it just numerically becomes smooth and uh, stable. Uh, and so that's actually a uh, leadership name people call Watson and again, classically. Uh, we actually uh, propose a way to study this kind of uh, norm for quantum. And we also implement that in, in an in efficient way into this quantum GAN architecture. So when I say efficient, is that it's just everything in principle, if you give me a quantum computer, they can be done uh, in polynomial time. And uh, if you're like a physicist, I just want to point out, there has been a study using this quantum optimal transport I'll uh, start non-equilibrium physics. Okay, so if you can just bear with me just a, f a few more minutes. Uh, I want to just talk about something that uh, uh, is kind of a bonus to the, the talk. So uh, I have talking about, yes? Is the quantum water sign distance a uniquely defined thing or? Uh, no, it's not really a uniquely defined thing. I think there has been a few different proposals. So what's your favorite here? Um, depending on your purpose, because uh, for ours, uh, Proposal, you need to be you, you need to be able to implement that efficiently. So it's not just a pure mathematical op, you know, concept, because we want to actually run in using that norm. So so there are many different factors you need to take into consideration. So what is the one that favors implementation? Uh, I think uh, at least as uh, far as I know, I think we're the only one has considered implementation. So the other just pure mathematical proposals. Um, okay, so sorry, um, so just get back to this. Uh, so we have, I have been talking about, uh, you know, the training uh, of, uh, you know, uh, neural networks or quantum neural networks, but I want to also highlight that um, there has been some, you know, I'm not sure if it's gonna be uh, the real parameter shift, but there's, there's, uh, we do see a new programming paradigm. Uh, people call it differentiable uh, pro in a program language. And uh, so if you haven't heard this, it's fine. Um, but uh, what it really gives you, it gives you two, uh, you know, two types of basic sense. One is that we might heard this uh, you know, successful gradient-based uh, uh, training, and you heard like uh, maybe uh, you know, autograd or back uh, propagation for training this kind of system. So now you hope this can be automatically done. You don't need to do that anymore. So this is something people already you know, have, say, in TensorFlow or PyTorch. So there are another type of sense that maybe uh, can, can we create something called a neural symbolic application? So, you, uh, so neural network is good in terms of, you know, it has been very successful, 
but it's really hard to interpret so what's the meaning of that you know and uh, why it can work it can uh, so the neurosymbolic application basic ask question can we combine the program uh, features and uh, the neural network to create some useful uh, uh, you know uh, tasks uh, sorry useful applications so it makes sense that it's more interpretable and actually sometimes because uh, you know some program features are very hard for neural network to achieve it can give you some you know much much nicer you know feature even for the applications so um, so we do have one work just along this line we uh, try to think about uh, what we can do if we want to define a differentiable quantum program language is actually motivated for after two things to again just following those uh, two concepts. So for the first thing, we do want to use gradient-based training for quantum ones, and we need to compute a gradient at least. So uh, and we cannot compute a gradient by classical means because that's not uh, scalable. So uh, so in this uh, paper up here, uh, going to appear this year, PIDI. So we started how you can use quantum programs to compute the gradients of any other quantum programs. So when I say quantum group programs is actually in general beyond in just a circuit, it can have a lot of program features. <coughs> and we also demonstrated one neurosymbolic applications of a quantum where we have the version of quantum circuits plus some like, uh, you know, control. Control measurement. We use that to solve some problem that is is much much more efficient than uh, the previous uh, you know methods. Of course, if you uh, cares about like classical program language, so I think our you know proposal generates both differentiable ones, the probabilistic ones. So you might have a way to unify them. And uh, I think that's all for my talk. And if you're interested uh, to play with our you know. Uh, you know, tools, we, I think they're av available on GitHub. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? So, so you mentioned this neuro symbolic thing, which, in, which I saw included also neuro Turing machines. So, yes. is your proposal to take neuro Turing machines and apply some kind of quantum? Uh, so, I, th I think this is more like. Uh, uh, you want to have a quantum version of that, right? So you have, you, do, you basically just want to mix the quantum programs with uh, quantum circuits and now make all, everything tunable, everything become parameterized. And you ask, can you train that for some applications? So, so your paper would also cover that case? Oh, I, I didn't cover neurotrain machine, but that's, uh, you know, we only cover a very simple case where we have the control. So we, we can do some like, uh, uh, intermediate measurement in the circuits and tell you what you want to do next. Yeah, but you know that could be an interesting direction to explore. Yeah. So, um, for your, you had this interference example to create local minima for quantum circuits. Um, is that coming from the measurement control? So, so, so that's a good question. As I said, uh, I want to make uh, the the effects of like encoding and the measurement out of the picture. So I use a very simple measurement, and and even you think you use uh, you know complicated uh, complicated measurement is still a linear combination of your coefficients because the measurement itself is not a parameterized. So it does not create like a nonlinear term. Yeah. Yes. So you mentioned that in the energy landscape of these quantum neural networks, we still have lots of local minima. Can we say something about whether they generalize as well as global minima, or, or they are just uh, poor generalizers? Oh, you, you're talking about the what are those local? Well, I mean, in the classical literature, local optima often perform as good as, as global. Yeah. Yeah, so this is like a... Thing so uh, at least for our example, we, we make sure that won't happen. So we really create that uh, local optimal. But you you could also ask the question whether for like a really practical instance, whether low, or lower sensor like a, I think there's word like a superis, uh, you know, local optimals or not. I, I, we don't know the answer for that. I just say for our construction, we make sure they're bad. Okay, uh, thanks very much.